church, we would love it if you would stand and worship with us.
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let you're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let you're never gonna let me
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when
love you and we worship you. God, we thank you for your love that never ceases, it never ends. That you're an all-loving God. It doesn't matter how many times we mess up, how many times we sin. Father God, you love us. And you're just waiting with your arms wide open, waiting for us to run back into your arms. Your love is not like the love that the world has to offer. Your love is, is perfect. It's never ending. God, we love you. And God, we, we just want to wanna know you more today. So God, we ask that you would open our hearts. That God, you would open our, our ears today. That we would hear everything that you want us to hear today. God, that we would be changed from the inside out. God, we thank you for your love and for your mercy. We thank you for this time that we've had to worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us. If you're online, thank you for joining us online. Before you're seated, turn around and say hello to somebody. church. Good morning, church. There we go. It is great to see you. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us today. If you're online, thank you for joining us online. Uh, we just have a few announcements uh, that we want to go through before we uh, continue on with the service. Uh, first off, we want to remind, uh, if you are a part of the Usher team, uh, this coming Thursday, uh, we're having a meeting for the ushers. It's just a great time. Uh, as we're getting ready for the Easter season and uh, Easter Sunday and things like that, it's great for our ushers to be on the same page. And so they're going to have a meeting this coming Thursday uh, at 7 o'clock. We're going to meet right in here in the sanctuary. And uh, what's that? Or if you want to be an usher. So we are now opening this up to potential ushers. So if you've sat in your seat and you thought, I'd like to be an usher, come this Thursday and we will get you filled in. It is going to be uh, just a great time. What a great ministry, honestly, to, to be able to be a blessing to each and every person who comes in, um, our, our regular attenders, and then also uh, guests and visitors that come in uh, just, to be, uh, just to be a help to people finding seats and lots of other things. So that's this Thursday at 7 o'clock, meeting right in here. Uh, coming up on April 28th is the Bowling Green Pregnancy Center Gala, and uh, we just want to let you know that we still have uh, room at our table, and if you are interested in that, the last day to sign up is next Sunday. So if you are thinking about it, uh, there are still seats available. We'd love for you to sign up today. You can also uh, fill out the check. Uh, it's $30 a seat that covers your meal and just the whole event for the night. It's a great evening. And uh, if you have any questions about that, you can stop by the Welcome Center, and they'd love to give you a little more information about that. Uh, you can drop off checks there as well, and then the church will send in one check to cover the table. So that is coming up on April 28th at 6 p.m. Uh, that's just a, a great opportunity to be a blessing to the Bowling Green Pregnancy Center. Along with that, uh, about a... Two months ago, we handed out uh, baby bottles to collect your spare change for the Bowling Green Pregnancy Center. Uh, it's amazing how just a little bit of your change with other people's little bit of change adds up and can be a huge blessing to the Pregnancy Center. So if you have your baby bottle, uh, we'd love to encourage you to fill that change jar up. You can turn those in at the Welcome Center. If you don't have a baby bottle, you can put them in anything that holds change, and you can turn those in, and uh, we'd even return the, the plastic or whatever you bring them in. So uh, just, uh, just another way to be a blessing to the Bowling Green Pregnancy Green Pregnancy Center. Uh, we want to remind you that life groups happen every Sunday morning at 9.30. Life groups is just a, a time of Bible study, learning in the Word of God, getting to know each other uh, around tables and in breakfast. Uh, it's free breakfast, free coffee, and there's classes for all age groups. So we'd love to have you come and be a part of that each and every Sunday morning. And then also family night happens Wednesday night from 7 to 8.10. Again, there's something for all ages. Uh, there's nursery, children's ministry, 
youth ministry. There's an adult class and a class just for the ladies only. Uh, just a lot of great things going on each and every Wednesday. We'd love to have you come and be a part of it. And then finally, uh, if you are a guest or if you've changed some of your information, uh, we'd love it if you stop by the Welcome Center today and fill out this connection card. That way we have your most accurate email, cell phone, address. Uh, if you're new and you've never filled this out, we'd love to be able to send you a note saying thank you for being here and worshiping with us today. So if you'd be kind enough to fill those out, uh, that just helps us out as well. So uh, we're going to take up our offering and lots of different ways that that happens. If you're in-house, there are baskets in the back. You can drop off your tithes and your offerings there. You can also download the Church Center app, which if you have any smartphone, uh, is very easy to do. Lots of information. You are able to do more than just give your, your tithes and your offerings. That way uh, you can watch previous services. There's announcements that are on there, just all different kinds of things uh, to go along with that. You can also text 84321. Or you can go to cgs.church and you click, can click on the giving tab. Uh, real quick before we pray for the offering, uh, one last thing that I forgot about is this Wednesday, uh, Deposits for Impact Summer Camp are due this Wednesday along with paperwork so we can start getting your kids registered. Uh, we're projecting about 1,000 people at summer camp this year. Uh, so we are excited about that, but that also means spots fill up quickly. So please uh, get your students signed up and registered. Uh, it's going to be a great summer camp. If you have more questions about that, I'd love to talk to you about that after the service. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you, God, just for the time of worship that we've had together. And, and God, uh, just looking forward to what you want to say to us. God, you've blessed us in so many different areas. And God, we just want to give back to you. So God, uh, we ask that you take these tithes and these offerings and use it you, to further your kingdom, God, to do your work all across the world. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. It is good to see you. Thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning. My name is Brad Keen. I am the lead pastor here. And if you are a guest, thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning. Well, we are going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to continue on in our series and just dig into the Word of God and see what He has for us this morning. So let's go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and God, we are so thankful that you are a good God. God, we pray that you would meet people right now, wherever they're at. Lord, those that might be watching online, those that are here in person today, God, whatever whatever need we have, God, if it's uh, a physical healing, God, we pray that you'd heal our bodies right now. Lord, we receive your, your healing. God, we pray that you'd be with those that have upcoming surgeries. Uh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you just move in this place this morning. God, we ask that you'd speak to us through your word. And uh, just reveal yourself to us. God, help us to draw closer to you as you've drawn close to us. We're so thankful for our time uh, in worship, God, to, to be able to glorify and praise your name. And now, God, may we glorify you and worship you as we dig into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in week three of our series. I hope that you are uh, enjoying this. Uh, we are looking at the days and the, the week that leads up to Jesus' death and then his resurrection. And we're looking at some of the prophecies that were foretold 700 years before Jesus came. And so it has been uh, good so far. I've had great feedback from you as we've been going through this. And, and even in my study time, there's little things that have popped out to me that have been fun to uh, maybe kind of see in a different light. You know, that's the great thing about the Word of God. You can read something a dozen times, a hundred times, a thousand times, and all of a sudden, Something else connects and it clicks uh, the way that it didn't before, and maybe God just reveals something to you, or maybe you put something together that you hadn't put together before. And, you know, for example, last week, uh, one of the things in, in my studies, and, and I shared it, that just kind of clicked for me, was the fact that Pilate, you know, would have lived along the coast, and he was there for the Passover, and so the whole way for the, the, the trial and the process to go as fast as it did, and for them to end up meeting before Pilate and having everybody right there, Pilate and Herod, uh, is because everybody was there for the Passover. And for whatever reason, I've read this story, I've preached on this, but it just kind of clicked in a new way of how, you know, this was prophesied 700 years before, and then people that shouldn't even been in that location were in that location all at the same time, and for everything to take place, you just see God's hand on it. And so it's just kind of one of those little pieces that, even though I'd read it before, it hadn't quite clicked the same way. And so it's fun when you dig into Scripture and you study Scripture, and different things can kind of just make sense and come together 
uh, for us. And so those are the kinds of things that help me to grow. Those are the, things, uh, the kind of things that help me to learn. And so uh, it's just great to be a student of God's Word. And, and so hopefully all of us, as we go through this series, uh, really become students of God's Word and we really understand uh, Jesus' death and, and the events that unfolded before that and then His resurrection in a new way uh, as we go through this. So we have three weeks now until Easter. Easter is really, really late this year and... Uh, Maybe it'll be nice and sunny that day, and we'll have a nice, you can go home and have a cookout with your family or something on Easter Sunday to, to celebrate. But we have three more weeks before, uh, before Easter when we together will gather that Sunday. I want to encourage you to invite your friends and, and family members because we are going to celebrate the greatest event in the history of the world, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, I hope that if you've not made him your Lord and your Savior, that you do today. Uh, before you leave. Well, today, the title of our sermon this morning is, He Was Counted Among the Rebels. And so we're going to start in Isaiah. We're going to take a look at Isaiah 53, 12. We're going to read the prophecy here, and then we will jump into the New Testament, and we will see how things unfolded. So Isaiah 53, 12, it says, I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier, because he exposed himself to death, he was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. You know, before Jesus could rise from the dead, before Jesus could be exalted, as we read here, before uh, he could have the honors of a victorious soldier, he had to suffer. He had to die a criminal's death on the cross first. And because Jesus died a criminal's death on the cross, he died one of the most brutal deaths imaginable. The most loving person, the greatest person to ever live, the greatest servant to ever live, the only person to live a life without sin, became the atoning sacrifice for us once and for all and died a very, very brutal death on the cross. And 700 years before Jesus comes to earth, the prophet Isaiah writes, he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels he bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. You know, another word that we could use here for expose, and in some translations of the Bible you see that, is the word submitted. Jesus submitted himself. In other words, he willingly gave himself up for death. You know, we looked at this last week, that Jesus was fully in control of everything that was happening. He knew the torture. He knew the pain. He knew the brutality of what he was about to go through. And because he knew that, we saw that in the Mount of Olives, when he went away to pray, that he actually sweat drops of blood. Now, I've had some pretty strenuous times in my life. I have yet to drop, sweat drops of blood. I don't know if anybody else has in here, but uh, let me know if you have. I'd like to talk to you. But I mean, this is the, the human level of the emotions that, that Jesus, being fully God but fully man, was feeling. He knew what he had come to earth to do, and that time had come, and so uh, he had to submit himself to God and to his plan and, and to go through with this. Ultimately, he surrendered to God's plan, and he even, he even prayed and said, God, if, if this cup could pass from me, I pray that, that it would do so, but ultimately, God, not my will, but your will be done. And that's the kind of prayer and that's the kind of life that those of us that have made a relationship with, with Jesus and have made him our Lord and Savior, that's, that's the standpoint that we should live life from, amen? Not my will, but your will be done. You know, we all have a will, don't we? If you have a little child and you're a parent, I guarantee you, you know your child has a will. And some children have stronger wills than other. Uh, some of us adults have stronger wills than other. We were the strong-willed ones when we were little. And so we have a will, but when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have to say, God, not my plan, not my will for, for my life, but your will be done in my life. And so we need to surrender. We need to submit to God in the same way in, in our life. And so in that moment, in the garden, Jesus submitted himself 
with following through with the plan that God had put in place and the reason why he had come to earth in the first place. So again, it's so important to understand, and I highlighted this last week, that no one took Jesus' life from him. Jesus willingly surrendered his life for us. Jesus willingly sacrificed himself. Jesus willingly went through. He had a will. He was fully God. He was fully man. And so he surrenders to God's plan and God's will for his life. Against all odds, because Jesus was perfect, because Jesus was sinless, he was sentenced to death on a cross. You know, Jesus was compared to Barabbas. You know, when given the chance, we read it last week, and we're going to read a little bit more about it uh, here today. When compared to Barabbas, the crowd picked Barabbas over Jesus against all odds. One of the worst of the worst criminals of the time. He was then crucified between two criminals. And so today I want to read from Matthew chapter 27. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn there. We are going to get the eyewitness account that Matthew provides for us. If you don't have your Bibles, the words will be on uh, the screen behind me. But last week, uh, we looked at parts of the stories from, from Mark and Luke and John and I realized we didn't give Matthew any love. So we're going to give Matthew some love this morning. And uh, we're going we're gonna to pick this up. But in this series, we are going to jump around uh, between all four of the Gospels. Uh, for the most part, they have similar uh, depictions of, of the same story. But every Gospel sometimes will highlight something a little bit differently. And so we are going to move around between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as we go through uh, this series together. Now, the story that we're reading here this morning, the part of the story, all four of the Gospels record this, and, uh, but by going through, again, all the different Gospels, and I hope to give you a better understanding as we go through this and, and just have a better picture of that week, those days leading up to Jesus' death and then his resurrection that we can get from looking at uh, the, different, uh, the different depictions within the Gospel. So Matthew chapter 27, we are going to start in verse 15. It says, at the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, who is it you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus? We have two opposite ends of the spectrum here. Who is called Christ. For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. Now again, Matthew is giving us an eyewitness account uh, of what has happened. So he adds this interesting detail here that none of the other gospels have. Uh, again, verse 19, it says, while he, this is Pilate, was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with this righteous man, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. If nothing else, uh, one of the things that sticks out to me is it just shows how compromised Pilate was in his decision making. Because we looked last week that three different times Pilate found no guilt in Jesus. He found no reason uh, for Jesus to, to be crucified. Now, you know, he is the Roman governor. He is supposed to be administering justice for the justice that is needed, not based upon other people's opinions. Instead, we see here he's getting input from his wife. He's receiving input from the crowd as to what he's supposed to do with Jesus. And eventually, uh, he's going to cower to the opinions of others because the crowd is getting crazy. He's obviously getting pressure from his wife. And so, you know, these are some of the things that I love in Scripture. And, and maybe one day we'll understand when we're in heaven why a detail like this was put in here. But these are the kind of details that, to me, in studying Scripture are, are interesting to, uh, to look at and to read. And so this is uh, something that Matthew records that no one else does. All right, uh, verse 20. It says, The chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, What should I then do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all answered, crucify him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. 
When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. All the people answered, his blood be on, on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them and having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. You know, now we learned last week that Barabbas was a murderer. Uh, he'd actually led a rebellion against the Romans where he and his followers had killed people. You know, he was a bad dude. He was a bad guy. He wasn't just a guy that you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley uh, at night. You wouldn't want to meet him on the street during the day. And so this is not the kind of guy that you would want to be released back into the public. And so the crowd, though, is crying out for this murderer's release and to have Jesus, the blameless, perfect lamb, the son of God, crucified instead. You know, as I reflected on this this last week, this just really shows um, the bad decisions that people make really when they're, they're spiritually blind, which is what was going on here. These, these people just did not understand exactly what they were doing. There was a blindness, obviously, that was over them. So Pilate compares Jesus and Barabbas, and probably because Pilate wanted Jesus to be free, right? He's even asked the crowd, you know, what do you want me to do with this guy? I find no fault. Three different times he said there's no reason to execute Jesus. And, and Pilate probably thought that if he puts Jesus and Barabbas together, who's the crowd going to choose? Talk to me. You'd think, you'd think Jesus, right? You know, Pilate says, hey, I don't find any reason. I don't find any reason to execute Jesus who do you think the crowd's going to, want, they want a murderer among them, or would they release Jesus? You know, so Pilate's, Pilate's thinking, hey, if I put these two together, I can probably wash my hands of this, and they're, they're going to take Jesus, and I can be rid of this entire situation. I'll get myself out of trouble with the crowd. There's a riot that's starting. I'll get myself out of trouble with my wife. Guys, we all like to get out of trouble with our wives when we get in there. And so he's probably got this figure out, hey, I can release Jesus or Barabbas. I'll put them up together, and you know what? And they'll pick, they'll pick Jesus, but that's not what happened. Remember, Pilate has already found Jesus to be not guilty, and he said so. But what happens here is they didn't choose Jesus. They chose Barabbas, and not only did they not choose Jesus, what does Scripture say they did here? They started shouting, crucify him, crucify him, you know, getting louder and louder and more intense. So let's continue reading in, in verse 27. It says, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head and placed a staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, hail, king of the Jews. Then they spat on him. They took the staff. They kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe. They put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simeon, or Simon. They forced him to carry his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with gall to drink, but when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Then they sat down and were guarding him there. Above his head, they put the charge up against him in writing, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two criminals were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. So we see here that Jesus is led away to Golgotha, where he's cruci crucified between the two thieves. We've read that he was to be placed among the rebels. We read here the different uh, events that unfolded as Jesus was led away to Golgotha. And one of the big things that happened here is this Cyrenian man that's named Simon had to finish carrying Jesus' cross for him. And, and here's something that I wanted to point out this morning. And this is kind of sometimes where we get this picture. Uh, you know, we've seen it in the movie Passion of the Christ, if you've watched that, or you see it in a lot of the pictures, the painted uh, of Jesus carrying the cross. Have you ever seen Jesus in a picture where he wasn't carrying the full cross on his back as he's walking? No. 
But what would have happened at the time is Jesus was actually just carrying that cross beam. You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. He just carried the cross beam. The post was already at the crucifixion site. And I went through and looked at my different study Bibles. I have about five or six different translations that I'll go through. On some, and, and some of them left it out, but a lot of them actually had that in, in there as well. But oftentimes we just think of Jesus carrying the whole cross on his back. But to be completely accurate and historically accurate what happened, it's that big cross beam. So that's still pretty heavy, right? I mean, you gotta, if you're on a cross, that cross beam is still very, very heavy. And at this point, we know that Jesus has been, he's, we just got done reading, he'd been beaten with a, with a staff. He's got a crown of thorns placed on his head. He's been whipped almost to the point of death. We read last, last week that he scarcely looked as though he was still a man. So he's probably lost an incredible amount of blood. He's weak from the torture and the torment that he's gone through. And so he needs help carrying this. So there's a Cyrenian man uh, named Simon, which is pulled out of the crowd and, uh, and helps to carry uh, that cross beam to the execution site. Isaiah 53 tells us that he was counted among the rebels. And we see that here in verse 38. And that two known criminals were crucified with him, one on his left and one on his right. Now, at this point, I want to move over to Luke chapter 23. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 23. We're going to start in verse 35. And I want to take a look now at the conversations that were taking place while Jesus was on the cross because we had the crowd that was there. We had the spectators. You've got the guys that are on the cross, on the, cross the rebels. You've got the different officials and rulers that are there at that time. And so let's take a look at the different conversations and things that were taking place. So Luke chapter 23, verse 35. says, the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, he saved others. Let him save himself. If this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself as us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So again, we have four different groups of people that are here that are mocking Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. We've got the, the religious rulers, the, the leaders of the day that are mocking him, saying, hey, you can save others. Why don't you, you save yourself? And, and we've got the crowd, the people that have gathered together that are also mocking Jesus. You've got the soldiers at the foot of the cross that are mocking Jesus. And then you have one of the two criminals as he's hanging there being executed, mocking Jesus as he too is on the cross. And what really stu stood out to me this last week as I was studying and preparing for this morning is, is how much this really hasn't changed from today. You know, Jesus died for all of us that we might have a hope here on earth but might have eternal life as well. But how many people don't accept that free gift of salvation? How many people turn their backs on, it's a free gift, but as I've said many times, the costliest free gift ever given. How many people reject the free gift that Jesus has given them? And so we see that same depiction that we see in our world today. We see those that, that open their arms and accept and open their hearts and accept Jesus into their heart and they make him their Lord and their Savior. And then you have the people that turn their back and they reject God and, and maybe they believe there isn't a God or uh, whatever the reason they don't believe in God yeah, that Jesus is the one true living God, and so they turn their backs on him. And so we have this depiction on the cross, and we have that same reality in the world today where those that, that turn to Jesus and those that turn away from Jesus. But something amazing here happens in the last couple of verses. One of the criminals gets it. He gets it right at the very last moment before he dies. Because when we leave this earth, we're going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell, guys. Right? You know, this is, we're going to get a little heavy here. We're going to go to heaven or we're going to go to hell. That's it. 
That's it. There's one of two places we're going to go. We're not just going to go into oblivion where we cease to exist. We're not just, you know, going to go sit around a campfire in the sky somewhere. There's heaven and there's hell. There's a place of weeping and mourning and gnashing of teeth. And there's a, a place of worship and praise and living with God for eternity and all the saints that have gone before us. And we're going to go to one of those two places. And so this one thief, he gets it at the very last moment. And he receives the gift of eternal life. Now bringing this full circle to the prophetic fulfillment from Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12. The question I want to ask this morning is why would God let his son be placed among the criminals. You know, why not just by himself? Going through, uh, going through a crucifixion is a very humiliating and a degrading process. You know, why did Jesus, as was prophesied, why did he have to be counted among the rebels? Have you ever thought about that? Have you, have you ever asked that question? Why was there a man on his right and on his left, a thief on each side? Why didn't Jesus just get crucified by himself that day? Why did he have to die between two known criminals? Why would God let his son die a criminal's death with other criminals? Well, there's a few things that I want us to consider this morning that will help to answer that question. The first one is this. God allowed it because Jesus wasn't a criminal. Jesus wasn't a criminal. It's the perfect contrast because Jesus lived the perfect life. Jesus was sinless. Jesus was the servant to all. And similar to Jesus being compared to Barabbas, where the crowd chose Barabbas, he's now in contrast between the thieves and himself, having broken no laws, being the only person to ever live this life sinlessly. However, I submit to you this morning that both you and I are criminals. Right? I know that might be hard to think about for some of you right now. You're like, no, I'm not. Maybe you've been to jail. Maybe you haven't been to jail. That's not really what I'm talking about this morning. But you and I, from God's standpoint, are criminals because the moment we sin the first time, we're guilty of sin and our punishment is eternal death. Right? The very first time we sin, we're guilty of death. If you're guilty of death, you could call yourself a criminal, right? Again, it's the perfect contrast on the cross. The criminal's deserving of death and Jesus who is not. Without Jesus dying on the cross for us, we have no hope. We have no future. We face a guaranteed certain eternal death. You know, let's, let's just be real about the gravity of the situation that we face. Without accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, every one of us face an eternity in hell. Right? Every one of us. If Jesus is not our Lord and Savior, and hell is not this big party place. Sometimes the world likes to talk about it, like, yeah, I'll meet you in hell. We'll party. The Bible talks about hell being a, a place of torture and, and weeping and gnashing of teeth and, 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 and you know, you, you just, you, you're, in, you're in pain. You're in torture all the time in, in, the, in, the, in the lake of fire, in the pit of hell. You know, we like the Jesus loves me teachings. We like the God is my father teachings. And he is, right? And Jesus does love us, right? He loved us so much that he died on the cross for us. So that we might not face an eternity in hell. But we can all have an eternity in heaven. And one of the things that I think is, is just as great as that is that we can live a life of purpose now as well. There are so many people that live this life with no sense of purpose. No sense of direction. It's all about, I got to find myself. I got to make myself happy. I just saw, I don't know, the other day that some university is now offering um, some kind of a major in 
self joy or finding yourself or something. It only costs like $17,000 a year to go major in how to be happy or something stupid like that. <clears throat> there be a lot of people sign up for that class too. But that's the, that's the secular humanistic uh, worldview of the day. It's all about self. It's all about pleasure. It's all about me. We can live a life of purpose today. We don't just get eternity in heaven. We can live a life of purpose on the earth today because the reality is there's heaven if we repent and there's hell if we don't repent. See, Jesus wasn't guilty, but he was counted among the criminals because we are guilty, guys. The moment we sin, the very first time, we are guilty and we are separated from God. See, Jesus was that substitutionary atonement, which means he died in our place so that we don't have to die, which means when we come to Christ, we trade our life for his life, which is why when we make Jesus our Savior, we don't just make him our Savior, we also make him our Lord. Make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life. When someone is Lord of your life, that means they are in control. We are surrendering to God and allowing his will to be done in our life. Sometimes our sin nature likes to creep in there, though, and we want to try to do things our way. But that's what we surrender to. That's what we do. We make Jesus our Lord and our Savior. Unfortunately, sometimes when a person faces the reality that they're a lawbreaker, that they're guilty, sometimes people try to brush it off. Maybe you were there at one time in your life, or maybe you're watching online today and you're there as well. You think, you know what? But I'm a good person. Have you ever witnessed to someone before and you're telling about Jesus, but I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not. But inherently, if we've sinned, we're separated from God, right? So whether you're a good person or not, you know, about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, going back and forth between here to, to Minnesota to see my parents there was one spot on the tollway in Chicago where before I got the, the easy pass thing for just zipping through on the tollway, I missed this toll one time. And it was only like a $1.50, $1.60 type toll. It wasn't that big of a toll. And it's one of those where you actually had to kind of like pull off to the side and pay your toll. And, and uh, I was like cruising right on by and hanging out in traffic. And psh, I went through I'm like, oh no, what am I going to do? I didn't pay my toll. And I got back here and I was telling somebody else, like, oh, I've missed a toll before too. Don't worry about it. So I'm like, oh, all right, cool. That's the only buck and a half, whatever. I don't worry about it. I didn't worry about it. I mean, I'm a good driver. I paid all my other tolls. Well, then about eight, ten months later, sometime in the same year, coming back from Minnesota, I missed the same toll again. I'm like, oh, I'm like, ha, it's all right. I'm a good driver. No big deal. Well, guess what? Eventually, the state of Illinois caught up with me. And they sent me a letter in the mail for my $3 worth of tolls. It was like $60 or $80 in fines. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And I called them up, and I read that poor person the riot act, which they couldn't do anything anyways. Because I was upset. I was hot. I was mad. They didn't care that I'd paid 15 tolls each way Four times I missed two lousy tolls for about three bucks. They said, you're guilty, buddy. Pay up. And I had to pay up. It didn't matter that I was a good driver. It didn't matter that I had a clean driving record. It didn't matter that I'd paid all the other, other tolls. I was a low criminal in their eyes. <laughs> and guilty. And I need to pay my fines. See, the point is brushing off sin is a costly mistake that can cost us our life by thinking, well, I'm just a good person. And while some people brush off their offenses, there are other people that beat themselves up over their offenses. I'm horrible. I'm terrible. You know, I'm kind of one of those kind of people myself. There's no harder critic on their life than me. Anyone else like that? Come on, somebody give me some love today. Make me not feel. All right, yeah. Yeah, I have a real hard time brushing stuff off. You know, if I owe someone 50 cents, I got to pay it back. 
man, I don't want to be in debt at all. Man, I don't care. I've got to pay you 50 cents back. You know, I, you know I, I, am, I am harder on myself than anyone else. And so sometimes people uh, just think, you know what, I can't be forgiven. The things that I've done, the things that I've said, the way that I've acted. Maybe I have gone to jail. Maybe I've destroyed someone's life or their reputation. God won't forgive me. Often there's these two scenarios that play out in people's lives. They think I'm a good person or they think God won't accept me, God won't receive me. Or maybe there's a third person that just says, they're just agnostic to it all and just say, I don't believe that there is a God and, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the afterlife. A fourth reason that God allowed Jesus to be counted among the criminals is that he wanted us to know that no matter how low that we think we are or how bad we think we are, that he went even lower. Jesus came down to our level to bring us up. Jesus came down to earth, to our level, to bring us up. Jesus not only left being God in heaven to come to earth, he died a criminal's death, descended into the pits of hell. He conquered sin and death on our behalf. Matthew records this comparison to the criminals and his crucifixion so that every person can know that no matter how far down we've gone, no matter how bad we think we are, Jesus went even farther. He descended into the gates of hell, the pit of hell, and conquered sin and death on our behalf, church. Amen? Be a little more excited about that. Be a lot more excited about that. He came down to lift us up. He went even lower. All four Gospels record his death with the criminals. Isaiah prophesies it 700 years before it happens. And Paul records it in, uh, talks about in Philippians chapter 2, talking about the demonstration of God's love for us. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Adopt the same attitude as that of Jesus Christ. He's talking to us. Adopt the same attitude as that of Jesus Christ, when existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus came to earth as a man. And then he lowered himself again by insisting to not be treated like royalty or like a king or like a nobleman or somebody special. Jesus positioned himself at the bottom by becoming a servant, by becoming a servant to all. Wherever Jesus went, he served people. What a, what a great and lofty call for all of our lives. That everywhere we go, whether we're hanging out with our family, our friends, we're at work, people know that, hey, if they need something, they know that you're going to be right there to help them. They can count on you, that we would all serve God, but serve each other and, and treat everybody with that kind of kindness and respect. Jesus came into the world in humble form. He was born in a stable. He wasn't born in a palace. He wasn't even born in a home. And here's, here's the cool thing. Think about this. Who were the first people to see Jesus? The shepherds, right? Common, ordinary people. Actually, people that were less than ordinary. They were kind of the lower end of society. They get to see Jesus first. Not the royalty, not the rulers. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus explains his purpose to the disciples when he said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't just come to earth because he wanted to be God in flesh. He came to serve us. He came to give his life. He came to sacrifice his life, to be that substitutionary atonement, to conquer sin and death, to descend into hell, to conquer sin and death, and to rise again, to be sacrificed on our behalf so that our penalty for sin was paid once and for all. All we have to do is accept that forgiveness. 
and accept that gift of eternal life and exchange our life for his. So Jesus didn't just stop there. He went to the level of criminal. He died a criminal's death because we were guilty of sin. He humbled himself to criminal status and was obedient even to, point, to the point of death on a cross. Jesus let them crucify him. Again, we, we looked at this last week. We saw last week that Jesus was silent. Why? Because Jesus could have talked himself out of it. I'm convinced of it. You look at all the different points in Scripture where the Pharisees or Sadducees and people tried to entrap Jesus. And Jesus always had the right answer. Or Jesus would tell a parable, one of his stories. But Jesus was silent because he knew his time had come. And it was time to willingly surrender his life to God's plan and to die in our place. Death on a cross was actually one of the most humiliating deaths possible for a Jew. And so Jesus stepped that low so that you and I and everyone else that would, would know that no matter what, no matter how far down we think we are, Jesus went even further to die the death, a criminal's death on a cross in our behalf. That's the kind of incredible love that God has for you and for me. It's hard to, to even calculate and to think that God would come to earth and take on human form and die the most bu brutal death possible so that you and I might have eternal life. Jesus came down so that we could go up. Let's finish this passage in Philippians. We'll close. Uh, verse 9 says, For this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name, so that the, at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know, we read here that at the appointed time, God lifted him up. And he wasn't just exalted, but he was highly exalted. God gave him the name that is above every other name. Church, when you are going through uh, just an attack in your life, when you just sometimes feel the attack of the devil on your life, speak the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Claim the blood of Jesus. Everything else has to flee. No demonic power, no demonic influence in your life has any place. Say, in the name of Jesus, devil, you have to flee. And guess what? He's got to go. Amen? He's got to go. The name of Jesus is exalted. It's higher than any other name. When we are going, sometimes, let's just be honest, sometimes I think we give the devil way too much credit. Oh, the devil's bugging me. Oh, the devil's just this. Oh, the devil's just that. What about what's God doing for you? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. But sometimes, I'm just going to tell you, sometimes Christians, we live such a defeated life. Oh, but the devil's just attacking me. Anyone ever been there? It's so terrible, the devil, the devil, the devil. Well, how come your eyes are focused on the devil? Ouch, let me step on your toes there. Seriously, though, I mean, I'm not saying that we don't come under a demonic attack, but where, what are we looking to? Are we looking at that or are we looking to our hope? Right. Are we looking to God as the answer? Amen? Amen. Right. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth at the name of Jesus, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. At the final judgment, even those that are condemned to death, will recognize that Jesus has all authority and that his name is higher than the other, any other name and that he has the authority to rule and to reign. My question this morning to you is, are you prepared to meet him? If you died today, are you prepared, are you prepared to meet Jesus? Every one of us is going to confess our lordship one day. For all of us that are living, we can do that now. We can confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior of our life. The reason that Jesus came all the way down to die a criminal death was so that you and I, even if we felt as low as a criminal, we can be raised to eternal life in heaven with God. None of us have done anything that's so bad that God won't forgive us and that God won't love us. 
Jesus died for everyone. Amen? He not only loves you, he died for you. So today, if you've had barriers and walls up in your life, allow God to break those down. Let them into your life. Let them into your heart. Let them into your sin. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. And accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior of your life. Let's stand as we close in prayer. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, we're going to have prayer teams down here this morning. Just want to invite you, make today the day of salvation. Let this Easter be the greatest Easter that you've ever celebrated. If you've walked away from the Lord, I want to invite you back this morning. Come down and pray with one of our prayer team members. Recommit your life to Jesus. Ask Jesus into your heart the first time. Swallow the pride of thinking that you can do life on your own, of thinking that you're a good person because you're not. We're not. Jesus died a criminal death because from God's standpoint, we are all guilty of death if we don't accept Jesus as our Savior. And God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to the cross so that that wouldn't happen. Make today the day of salvation. Heavenly Father, we come before you. God, just pray that everyone that is here, Father God, this morning, everyone that's watching this online, God, if they don't know you, Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd move in their hearts and their lives that today would be the day of salvation. God, none of us are good in and of ourselves. None of us have done anything that is so bad as well that you won't accept us, that you won't forgive us, that you won't live in and through us. So God, pray that you just move on hearts and lives today. God, whatever uh, other needs we might have, God, we pray that you would be Lord of them. We give them to you. God, we ask us to use us for your purpose and glory this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week. Uh, Again, invite someone to Easter service, uh, and we look forward to seeing you Wednesday or next Sunday. God bless you.